scriptures here. Matthew chapter six, verse nine. Jesus said this, pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. I'm going to take it back to the first verse. And um, prayer, uh, you know, as I was praying about this and looking into it and doing some study and different things, I, I thought, you know, where does the concept of prayer even come from? It's one of those words we take for granted. And so I like to see how the same word is used in the secular context of the time. There was no other way to use the word prayer at the time. It, it always referred to uh, a relationship with God. And prayer, I believe, originated uh, in the Old Testament upon the realization that God was present and acting on their behalf. And God's presence invites a response. We call that response prayer. His presence invites a response. Prayer is something that uh, we all desire to have a deeper knowledge of. We instinctively know and believe that prayer works, that it's powerful, but when it comes to doing it, it's often a different story. We don't know how to pray oftentimes like we would like to. So Jesus taught this, and it's also recorded in Luke on a different occasion, but in Luke, it says this, they said to him in Luke 11, Lord, teach us to pray. And I think it's kind of interesting that they didn't say, teach us a prayer, but teach us to pray. I remember a man came up to me whose wife was very sick one time, and he wanted to know the exact prayer that he should pray to get his wife well. What was the prayer that God would listen to to heal his wife? So he was taking notes. I was just talking kind of spontaneously about how I would pray in that situation. And he was writing, is that the word is or are? You know, he wanted every specific word he was a Hindu and his wife was in India. <laughs> and she was sick there. And he's like, give me every specific word. And I'm trying to tell him, it's a conversation, but he wasn't getting it. And he wanted me to teach him a prayer. But what they really needed to know, and in Luke's gospel, it says this, Lord, they said to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. It's not so much the specific prayer, although we have this beautiful Lord's Prayer, which is a prayer and a model for prayer, both. It's not the only way that people can pray, but it is a powerful and a beautiful way that people can pray. So you'll notice uh, in the first part of the Lord's Prayer, there's the part that deals with God. God, I recognize who you are, I know where you are. I know what you see. I know you have a kingdom and a will, and I submit my life to that. That's the first part. The second part is really about us. Give us this day our daily bread. See, oftentimes we get out of balance when we pray and we talk to God. We skip the first part about who God is, and we jump right into our felt need, which is kind of, the, you know, natural to us. But that isn't what Jesus was talking about here. 
We skip the first part and immediately go to the second part. Lord, I need help. Well, it's better to begin prayer aware of God and get to our problems later. I read uh, in a commentary by Spurgeon his thoughts about what the Lord's Prayer teaches us about ourselves, and I thought it was really interesting. Spurgeon said that it begins with our Father, and it describes a child who's away from home. We're not in heaven, but we are his child. A child away from home. Hallowed be thy name. It describes a worshiper. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. It describes a servant. Give us this day. It describes a beggar. Forgive us our debts. It describes a sinner. Lead us not into temptation. It describes a sinner concerned that they don't fall deeper into sin. And I thought, you know, I never really looked at the different stations of humanity that were enclosed there in the Lord's Prayer. But the best way to pray is to begin with God and then to work our way towards ourselves. So we have this pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We don't just come to God and say, hey God, I want this. Or hey God, wouldn't it be great if you, you know, we step back and we realize who it is that we're talking to. We're talking to the Lord. And God being in heaven, he has a vantage point that I don't have. He's in heaven, I'm on the earth, he sees what I don't see. He knows what I don't know. And he's not really all bound up about what I'm bound up about. He has the big picture as the Father in heaven. I find when I pray with that perspective, I have more faith. As I pause to recognize who it is I'm talking to, I'm not talking to you know, my neighbor on the street, or, you know, I'm not talking into someone that when I'm done, they, they just say, well, you know, you got to vent. You know, we're not venting when we're praying. We're not talking about just releasing steam about the problems we have. You know, we're talking about our Father who is in heaven, and we're talking to God. And I have a relationship with him. He's He's my father, I'm his child, and he's in heaven, and he has all the resources needed for what I bring before him. I love the story in Acts chapter 4 of the early church when they were told they must never again speak in the name of Jesus under threat. They'd been arrested, released, told, don't you ever speak to people in the name of Jesus again. Well, what would we do when we came to God in prayer? Oh, Lord, help! What are we going to do? Well, Acts chapter 4 says this. When they had been released, verse 23, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they lifted up their voices to God with one accord and said, you know, here's what all of us probably would have said, or, or at least most of us, or a chunk of us would have said in one accord, this is terrible! <laughs> here's what they said. In one accord. O oh Lord, it's you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. God, you created everything. This little problem isn't such a big problem to you. 
See, they lift up their voice, Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And the inference is the chief priests and the elders sure didn't do that. <laughs> you know, the people who were threatening them sure didn't do that. But God in heaven, he did that. And it's you who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? So they're calling these threats futile things. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers were gathered together, they're quoting this from the Old Testament, against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. And this is what they pray about the threats that they'd been given. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. That was their prayer. And it starts with, let's get this in perspective. The one who created the fish in the sea is the one we're talking to. And even though we've been threatened, speak no more in this name of Jesus. Lord, grant that we may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place. They just weren't gonna back down. What they had was too important to share and they just were not going to be intimidated or silenced by people who didn't create the sea and the fish. They were serving the one who did. And I just think that's really such a, a beautiful, beautiful prayer. So, you know, even in their trials in the early church, you have to get God-centered when you pray. So when we pray, we begin with God. He's our Father. He's in heaven, and we say, hallowed be your name, set apart. You're unique in all the universe, Lord. Your name is high above the name of disease. Your name is high above the name of trials. Your name is high above the name of fear. Your, you know, whatever it is, hallowed be your name. Your name is set apart. Yours is the primary name. Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what is God's kingdom? I lived in a country for eight years where at the time they had a queen. Now they have a king. <laughs> England, Scotland. A kingdom is the dimension where a king has rule. And in praying your kingdom come, Lord, establish your reign, establish your rule in my circumstances like it is in heaven. His rule in heaven is immediate. His rule in heaven does not diminish. His rule in heaven is unchallenged. His rule in heaven is sovereign. We live in a realm that is yet fallen. There is still an enemy round about. People still make mistakes. And when we pray, your kingdom come, Lord, bring your lordship into this situation on earth just like it is in heaven. That's the prayer of a servant. Establish your reign. And I, I literally do pray this way regarding our daughter and in other things. Lord Jesus, let the dimension of your reign be established in these circumstances on earth 
where there's opposition, on earth where things aren't perfect, on earth where people get it wrong, on earth where there's a devil. Establish your reign here as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love some of the verses where Jesus talks about the kingdom. Matthew 12, 28, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. There's, there's an, a realm where a demon had control in someone's life. But Jesus brought the reign of God into that person's life and delivered them from the spirit. And I love how it's put in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I've been around casting out demons a few times in my life, probably three in all of my life. And in the times that I've been involved in them, it hasn't been easy Here's Jesus, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, <laughs> just the kingdom has come upon you. I love that. You know, he didn't get all wound up and you know, it wasn't this big fight and just... That's his reign being done on earth as it is in heaven. When I'm talking to God about establishing his kingdom, I'm really talking to him about ruling in my life. Does he rule in your life? Is he your king? Does he have authority in your life? Have you surrendered your life to him? When you're praying your kingdom come, what you're saying is, I want to be a part of your kingdom. I want to be in that realm where you rule. And Lord, I give myself to you. That place of the altar, that place of surrender, that place of giving ourselves back to God and saying, God, more than I want my will in my life, I want your will and I present myself to you. Your kingdom come. Take reign in my life. You see, if his kingdom comes, when his kingdom comes, there, there's things that have to stop happening in our lives because they're not under his kingdom. And there's things that have to begin happening in our lives because they are part of his kingdom. It's the place where Jesus rules. So he says, verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. Now here's the change. And uh, you know, the first part is about God. We get that place, we get surrendered to him, submitted to him, acknowledging who he is. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation. Well, our problem is, we want far more than our daily bread. We want decades worth <laughs> in the bank, you know, in the 401, 503, you know. Uh, we want bunches. And sometimes God in his goodness provides for that for people and that's a joy when he does. But people in this time, living was very hard and they, they had a difficult time even having daily bread often, depending on the rain and things like that. Uh, they didn't have freezers, they didn't have Walmarts, they didn't have Instacart, they didn't even have Shop and Save or what's the one right over here, the little one? you know, the, whatever it is, convenience stores. I remember I 
had a visitor one time from the South American country of Suriname. And uh, the first place he wanted to go was to buy uh, some little food item. So I took him over to the convenience store, Unimart, whatever it is. And he's walking around looking in the Unimart and going, oh, the selection. <laughs> So I took him to Giant Eagle. <laughs> and he said, you have seven kinds of orange juice? <laughs> With pulp, no pulp, extra pulp, calcium. Is there? <laughs> but there's other ways that we have to get from God on a daily basis what we need, even if our literal provision may be taken care of. How about his peace on a daily basis? How about his love on a daily basis? Even if you're not in a position where you're in danger of running out of food, there's a lot of things that just need replenished on a daily basis. Our faith needs replenished on a daily basis. Our commitment to his purposes needs replenished on a daily basis. So he says, give us this day our daily bread. And this is the toughie. And forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. It's interesting that Jesus intertwined vertical forgiveness with horizontal forgiveness. Lord, as you forgive me, I'm forgiving others. Forgive me, Lord, with the same forgiveness that I receive from you that I will give to other people. Wow. Ephesians 4.32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. And he'll amplify that a little bit too. But you know, we often struggle with forgiving people. But if we've really seen what God has forgiven us of and what God's forgiveness has protected us from, eternity in hell, if we really see what his forgiveness has protected us from, we aspire to be like him. We aspire to forgive. You know, when Jesus forgave, it was a costly thing. It cost him. It wasn't just, oh, yeah, okay. I mean, he hung on a cross. He was brutalized. He was marred more than any man. And as he hung upon that cross in pain, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It wasn't after the pain was gone that he forgave. It was while he was in the worst of his pain that he forgave. Father, forgive them. You know, uh, we like to forgive after the pain's gone. But that's not the kind of forgiveness the Bible talks about. He forgave. And this prayer... It's interesting that Jesus put this in this prayer. Most of us, if we were going to write it, we'd just put, and forgive us our debts and lead us not into temptation. You know, we would skip over the other part about, as we have also forgiven our debtors. But Jesus didn't. It's all entwined. Verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. You know, the person who's really forgiven is anxious not to offend again. We've been forgiven. God, don't lead us into temptation. Don't let temptation get a grip upon my life. Lord, I want to please you. You know, lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Recognition that we need to be 
protected by God every step of the way. And he was delivered from evil. Not evil in the sense of sin, but evil in the sense of harm. Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That recognition, you know, temptation, Pastor Tom Duke gave a great message on temptation a while back. It equally means a temptation and a test. And the idea is, Lord, don't let me get into a situation where I'm tempted or tested above my ability to resist. I remember Pastor Tom talking about the devil wants a temptation to tempt us to do wrong, but God allows a test to show us we can get a passing grade. Amen? Amen. By not falling into the temptation. And how do we overcome temptation when it comes? Yours is the kingdom. I'm submitted to you. I've given my life to you. I want to please you. I don't want to pursue these things that are wrong in your sight. Yours is the kingdom. How am I going to have the power to overcome? Yours is the power. And who gets the glory when I'm living right? Yours is the glory. Forever. Forever. Amen. What a beautiful prayer. Do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from evil. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So that prayer can be prayed as a prayer. It can also be a model where we begin our own prayer list based on what this prayer that Jesus taught was. And it's a beautiful prayer. Prayer is an invitation to respond to God's goodness in our lives. It's an invitation to talk with him, to commune with him, to fellowship with him. And that's so important. You know, he, he wants us to talk to him. So, you know, again, prayer is one of those things. It's much easier to know how important it is than to actually do it. But we can bring a discipline into our lives where we actually are doing it. Praying. Coming into God's presence. And I really cannot tell you how much it has helped me on a personal level to begin prayer God-centered rather than need-centered. Just like you, I've had a lot of calamities in my life. I've had a lot of things that have happened that I wish had never happened. I've, I've had to face trials and mountains that I would never have chosen to face if I could have chosen one way or another. And people have said to me at different times, you know, you just take the punch and you keep going. Well, there's a secret to why I can take the punch and keep going. I know who my Father in heaven is. And I know he has the big picture. And I know I don't. And when you're in his presence, it's easy to trust him. It's a choice. But you don't begin by, oh God, this is the worst thing that's ever happened. You begin by, God, you're the one who made the fish in the sea and you're my father and you're in heaven and I come to you to put my own heart in that perspective so that I can dialogue with you about the things that are important to me. Sometimes we just treat prayer like 
venting. Oh God, this is awful. It's going to be awful. It's always been awful. It'll always be awful. It'll never get better. Thank you in Jesus' name. Goodbye. Oh, when my children come to me about needs in their life, that's not all I want to hear. I want to hear, hey, Dad, how are you doing? Dad, let me tell you about something positive that happened in my life. You know, they don't just only come running in and it's rotten, it's rotten, what am I going to do? Goodbye. They're my children. I hunger to commune with them. not just about their problems. They're my children. Is it any different with him? So I hope that I'm going to ask Eddie to come back up here. And you know, prayer isn't just a one-way conversation either. There's something about giving God time to speak to your heart or to show you something in his word, that's also really important. Some people say, does God speak? He speaks. He speaks. I remember one time uh, Charlene and I were praying together. This was many years ago. Have the rest of the team come up too. We were praying together and just waiting on the Lord. Sometimes we just wait quietly in his presence and we say, Holy Spirit, if there's anything you want to say, we're here to hear it. We just wait and see if the Lord does something. So we were doing that this one time and Charlene says to me, there's a man in the church who has a very critical attitude towards others. And I said, who is it? She says, it's you. (laughs) Well, that caused me to repent. Yeah, I didn't know I had a critical attitude. I thought I was just, you know, in the flow of life. But I looked at it at that time This is a lot of years ago, so don't try to figure it out. (laughs) But sometimes he speaks things that, um, adjustments we need to make too. Lord, if I'm really part of your kingdom, your kingdom needs to be in my attitude towards others. Even if they've got me upset. Right? Well, let's pray. And dear Lord, just want to thank you once again today for being with us. Thank you for your word. Thank you that you are our Father in heaven. Thank you for the stability that that brings into our lives. Thank you for the confidence and the peace of knowing we're not facing this life as orphans. We have a heavenly Father who created the fish and the sea and everything in them. And Lord, help us to have a new appreciation for prayer. Help us to have a new depth of prayer. Help us to pray in the pattern that you gave us by starting with you and not just our list of complaints or needs. Help prayer be a life lived between a father and a child. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.